Hello and welcome everyone to this podcast for cell biology. In this podcast and the next several podcasts over the next few days, we're going to talk about how cells obtain food and energy from that food. Up to now we've talked about various kinds of cells. We've talked about animal cells and we've talked about plant cells. We've talked about the membranes that surround the cells, the membranes within the, the cells, the mitochondria, the nucleus, the peroxisomes, all kinds of membranes in the cell. We've talked about how these membranes form. We've talked about how things can get across the membrane and how things can leave the cell and ex exit into the extracellular space. We've talked about the proteins within the cell, how they help build structures for the cell to do various activities in the cell. We've talked about the DNA in the nucleus. We've talked about all these things. We even talked about how energy is used in the cell. But we really haven't talked yet about how a cell gets the energy. What does a cell have to do to obtain that energy? But we haven't yet talked about how the cells are going to get that energy to maintain all these structures, to do all that work, to grow, to divide, to do other cellular functions. Well, whether you're an animal cell or a plant cell, you need energy in the form of some kind of chemical bonds. So let me write that here. Energy comes from chemical bonds. There's a great deal of potential energy in these chemical bonds. And usually what that means is various sugars, like glucose, we'll talk a lot about glucose, but, but also proteins that are broken down and the amino acids can be used, as well as fatty acids can be used to generate these chemical bonds that are going to be used to get energy for the cell. Animals are heterotrophs. They get their energy from different heterotrophic levels. So they have to eat other animals or plants to get these chemical bonds in the form of sugar, proteins, or fatty acids to be generated into energy. Plants are autotrophs. You can think of them as sort of self-feeders. They generate, or rather I should say, they synthesize their own food that is used for generating energy to do very cellular activities. So they make their own food, and we'll talk about this later on in the form of it making glucose. But it doesn't matter if we're talking about how an animal cell uses glucose, or a plant cell uses glucose, or a microbe, how it would use glucose. They all three use glucose in a very similar way, with of course some exceptions. So they take this glucose, and with oxygen, they can oxidate this glucose to generate CO2, water, ATP, and NADH. If you remember from a previous chapter, ATP and NADH are activated carriers. And we're going to focus on this pathway here, going from glucose to CO2, water, and ATP, and NADH, using these three separate pathways that I'll list here real quick. Glycolysis, and we'll come back to these later. Citric acid cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation, using electron transport. For the most part, what we're going to talk about today are the events of glycolysis. So how do we get energy out of sugar? Well, let's first just consider something outside of the cell. Sugar. This could be wood. The cellulose in wood is a sugar. Could be paper. All of these things have sugar in them. And with the help of oxygen, sugar can be converted into CO2 
plus water. To do this requires a fairly large energy investment. So a large activation of energy. All the free energy that is generated here is lost as heat. So all free energy is lost to heat. Now if this happened in the cell and all of the energy we obtained from our sugar molecules was lost as heat, that wouldn't be very useful. We want that energy to be stored in these activated carriers that we've talked about before. So this was in a non-cellular context. So let's talk about a cellular context. And as I mentioned, we want to make sure that when we use that sugar, we can save some of that energy. And it's not going to be very helpful if this energy of activation is huge. And so what happens in the breaking down of sugar through various steps, there are many smaller reactions, each with their own level of activation of energy. Okay. You still start off with glucose up here, and it still needs oxygen, but it's less of an initial energy investment. And energy in this process here is stored. So energy released in stored activated carriers like ATP and NADH. We still generate CO2 and water. All of these reactions along here are the reactions of glycolysis, the citric acid cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation. These are all examples of catabolic reactions. To remind you, catabolic reactions are those reactions that break down a larger molecule into a smaller molecule. Also to remind you, the reverse, the anabolic reactions, that would be building up these larger molecules from smaller ones. And when we talk about photosynthesis, that's when we'll come back and talk about anabolic reactions. So ATP we can think of as being made in two ways. In these catabolic reactions of glycolysis, citric acid cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation. The first way is using energetically favorable reactions to couple with the energetically unfavorable reaction of ADP plus inorganic phosphate to generate ATP. This pathway here is extremely unfavorable. It requires a great deal of energy to add this phosphate group to an existing ADP molecule to generate ATP. But the energy that we obtain in these energetically favorable reactions of glycolysis and the citric acid cycle are used to help couple this unfavorable reaction to generate this ATP. The next way cells can generate ATP is through oxidative phosphorylation. Oxidative phosphorylation can take energy from activated carriers like NADH and FADH2 to make a lot of ATP. We're not going to talk about oxidative phosphorylation yet. That's in the next chapter. So we'll talk about that later next week. Next, I'd like to talk about the breakdown of food molecules. And I'm going to talk about this in three different stages. And I'm going to draw the cell like here. And the first stage occurs outside of the cell. And stage one then is the breakdown 
of large food to simple subunits. So this could be proteins, being broken down to smaller components than amino acids. It could be large polysaccharides that are broken down into simple sugars like glucose. It could also be large fat molecules that are broken down into fatty acids plus glycerol. All of these can now enter into a cellular pathway to generate energy. However, for the rest of today, and really this whole unit, we're going to focus on using these simple sugars. So stage two, I'm going to draw over here, or write out over here, is the breakdown of sugars to acetyl-CoA plus some ATP, not a great deal, but some ATP and some NADH. This is largely going to be the process of glycolysis where we take glucose that enters the cell and with the help of glycolysis we'll produce two pyruvate molecules. We'll also generate ATP and NADH. Up to this point, everything has occurred in the cytoplasm. Glycolysis is a cytoplasmic event. But now these pyruvate molecules, one of their fates, and we'll talk about another fate later, but one of their fates is to enter into the mitochondria where they can be converted into acetyl-CoA in the matrix of the mitochondria. So let me write out mitochondria here. Okay, in stage three, acetyl-CoA is oxidized. This occurs in the citric acid cycle. So acetyl-CoA enzyme A here will enter into this citric acid cycle. And in the citric acid cycle, CO2 is generated, but so are these activated carriers, NADH, FADH2. From the citric acid cycle, NADH will undergo oxidative phosphorylation using the electron transport chain in this inner membrane. This will generate water plus lots of ATP. The main source of ATP comes through this route. Also, I should mention that this whole process generates a lot of heat. And that heat is also useful because that heat can be used to keep our bodies warm or our cells warm. What I'd like to do now is focus on glycolysis for the rest of the podcast here. Now let's move on to glycolysis. And we can think of glycolysis as a series of reactions, 10 to be more precise, that oxidizes glucose into 2-pyruvate without using oxygen. So I could write it down like this where we have our glucose molecule like so. It contains six carbons with hydroxyl groups coming off the corners here. There's an oxygen here and a CH2 and an OH. So that's our glucose molecule. It will enter into glycolysis in this, these first steps, and we'll talk about these in a moment. Two molecules of ATP are used. This is a six carbon sugar, and somewhere along the process of glycolysis, it's converted into two three carbon sugars. And in the end, it will produce these two three carbon sugars called pyruvate. It looks something like this. Now part here that is really important we talk about here, or at least indicate, is that 
in this process of going from a six carbon structure into two three carbon structures, we generate NADH and two molecules of ATP. So we use two molecules of ATP, but we gain four, so a total net gain of two ATP for every glucose molecule consumed, oxidized. Now I mentioned that there are 10 steps of glycolysis. I want to break it down, these 10 steps, into the three stages of glycolysis. Within these 10 steps, there are going to be a few reactions I want you to know a little bit about, but not all of them, just a few, and I'll point those out along the way. This first stage, let's call it energy investment. And in this energy investment stage, we start off with glucose at the beginning of the pathway. And to remind you, glucose has six carbons in it. This first step here is an important one. I'm going to label it one, and I'm going to put I R by it. In your notes, you want to make sure I R, you know, means irreversible. It's an irreversible pathway. And I'm going to put a star by it because we're going to come back to that and talk about it in a little bit more detail. The next pathway, the second pathway here, it is a reversible pathway. Then we have this third pathway. It, like the first one, is also irreversible. And I want to come back to that one as well. Okay, then at the end of step three here, we generate fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. And this ends our energy investment pathway. But I did not tell you why we call it energy investment, so this is pretty important. This first pathway requires ATP, as does this third step. So that's why we say it's energy investment. It's also part of the reason why we need to look at these reactions in a little bit more in-depth, and also because they are irreversible reactions. The next stage of glycolysis is a stage that we're going to describe as cleaving a six carbon molecule into two three carbon molecules. So fructose 1,6-bisphosphate undergoes a reaction in step four to generate two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. I'm also going to throw step five right here too because what really happens is you make one molecule of glycerol 3-phosphate and the other three carbon molecule has to go undergo further conversion step five to generate the second of these here. But for our purposes we can say that steps four and five takes fructose 1,6-bisphosphate to ultimately cre create two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. The third and last stage we're going to call the energy production stage. So in this third stage of energy production, we're going to take these glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate molecules and convert them into a considerable amount of energy for the cell. So the first thing that happens here is these two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate in step 6 and 7 are used to generate NADH in step 6 and ATP in step seven. These are important parts of glycolysis because they actually generate some products that are necessary for energy production directly anyhow. And so we're going to come back to those as well. Then we have step eight, which is reversible. And I should have also mentioned that these are reversible too. And then this is fed into step nine, which is also reversible. And then finally, in step 10 here, which is also our third irreversible reaction, we generate ATP. Again, we don't generate one molecule of ATP, we generate two because we have two glyceraldehyde 3-phosphates. And then ultimately our big product here at the end is pyruvate. Now while I have this here, I want to talk about two fates of pyruvate. What happens to our good friend here, pyruvate? It can do one of two things. The first, which is going to be the topic of our next podcast, is that pyruvate can be fed into our citric acid cycle and ultimately into oxidative phosphorylation to generate a considerable amount of ATP. However, for that to occur, oxygen is needed. 
Now, alternatively, pyruvate can enter into fermentation, a fermentation pathway. And in this process, it can make one of a couple products, depending on what kind of cells you're talking about. It can make lactic acid, and this is true in mammals. In yeast, however, fermentation yields ethanol, which can be used for beverages, it can be used for fuels, it could be used for various other food products. And the only thing it needs to convert pyruvate to ethanol or lactic acid is NADH. And where does it get the NADH from? It gets it from step six. And this produces as a byproduct NAD+. Now in order for glycolysis to continue to make pyruvate under fermentative conditions, which I should have said before, this is no oxygen, anaerobic conditions. So let me say that again. The only way this pathway can continue is if there is a source of NAD plus to move into step six to produce more NADH. So this feeds right back over here into step six. This allows the continuation of glycolysis producing pyruvate, which can be converted into lactic acid or ethanol when you're in a, an environment with no oxygen. Okay, now I'm gonna say one other thing on this board here. Because I said something a moment ago that wasn't 100% true. I said under conditions where oxygen is present, pyruvate can enter into the citric acid cycle and oxidative phosphorylation. And I said under conditions where there's no oxygen, it could enter into a fermentation pathway. There is a third option that I think is important that we mention. And that is the pathway of anaerobic respiration. Anaerobic would imply no oxygen, or at the very least, reduced levels of oxygen. So without oxygen, how can we enter into respiration? How can we use the citric acid cycle and oxidative phosphorylation? Now, something we haven't talked about, and we will later, is that the reason oxygen is important is that it acts as a final electron acceptor and then it produces the water. Oxygen makes an ideal electron acceptor because oxygen is a very, very good oxidizing agent. However, there are other oxidizing substances that can be used. They're not as good as oxygen, but they can still be used. So in anaerobic respiration, instead of oxygen, what is used is sulfate, nitrate, sulfur, or fumarate. Now, when do these occur? Not every organism is able to do this, but this is essential for anaerobic bacteria that live in areas where there's a lot of sulfur or a lot of nitrate or a lot of um, sulfates, and they can use that instead of oxygen as that final electron acceptor. Okay, so that was a bit of an aside talking about what we do with pyruvate, but that was an important aside because we wanted to um, finish that story. But what I want to do now is I want to spend some time talking about a couple of these reactions. Actually, five of these reactions. Steps one, three, six, seven, and ten. All right, so I'm going to draw these reactions that I want you to know a little bit more about over here on the right side. This first one, so I'll write a one here so you know which one I'm talking about. It takes glucose and converts it into glucose 6-phosphate. The enzyme that converts glucose to glucose 6-phosphate is called hexokinase. In making this conversion, ATP is used. So I want you to know that glucose is converted into glucose 6-phosphate. It uses an ATP and the enzyme is hexokinase. I also want you to know another very important thing about this reaction. And that is why is it important? Why is it that we want this to happen? And the key reason is that, is that once it's been phosphorylated, it cannot leave cell. So that's a, a pretty important thing. Because the last thing we want glucose to do is to 
Once it enters, enters the cell, it's to leave if it hasn't entered into glycolysis. Once it's been phosphorylated with hexyl kinase, it cannot leave the cell. So that's a very important pathway that you should know. You should also know that it is an irreversible pathway, as we've said before. The next pathway I want you to know a little bit more about is step three. In step three, we take fructose, 6-phosphate, and we convert that into fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, the same one that we see here. It's an irreversible reaction that's catalyzed by phosphofructokinase. Its product here is the last time we see 6-carbon structure in glycolysis. For steps six and seven, you don't really need to know the enzyme or the substrates and products. But I really want you to know is that in six and seven, we produce two NADHs and two ATP. Please remember that this is the first time that we're using three carbon sugars in this whole step pathway here. And so we're doubling the amount of NADH and ATP that's produced. Okay, now I do want you to know this very last pathway. It's the last pathway of glycolysis. And in this one, we take phosphoenol pyruvate and convert it into pyruvate, just like we saw here. I want you to know that the enzyme that catalyzes this reaction is pyruvate kinase. And in this process, we produce two ATP molecules. This pyruvate then, as I've said before, can now enter into aerobic respiration, into the citric acid cycle, or it can be fermented into ethanol or lactic acid, or in some species of bacteria, it can be used in anaerobic respiration. So let's summarize glycolysis you should know that it is cytoplasmic. It's a series of catabolic reactions, ultimately taking glucose into pyruvate, and more precisely, one molecule of glucose into two molecules of pyruvate. If we're thinking about energy here, we know it costs two ATP molecules but we gained four ATP and two NADHs. In the end, remember we started off with glucose, we end with two pyruvate molecules, two pyruvate molecules that are each three carbons in length. You should know that steps one, three, and 10 are irreversible. We like to think of these steps as major control steps of glycolysis. Okay, that's all I have to say about um, this first podcast on how we obtain energy from food and more specifically over glycolysis. If you have any questions at all, please make sure you come see me. If not, I'll see you in class. Bye.